get them in the George has got that right. My passion is the Southern Campaigns of the American Revolution. Um, wanted to tell you a little bit about an action called Parker's Ferry. Uh, Parker's Ferry is not um, studied very often. It's a, an action, when it's a good Marion action because it is a, an area when Marion is acting independently and Marion is uh, acting cooperatively as he normally does. And so we're talking about the uh, summer of 1781. This is after the British have begun their strategic pullback from Camden and from 96. And I've put a map up, which is um, not as bright as I'd like it to be. And you can see a red line that extends from Charleston in the center up to Orangeburg. And along the red line is where the British um, basically control the territory. Now in the summer of 1781, the British could really go anywhere they wanted to go, but they had to go in, in force. They had to go with probably 500 to 1,000 men, or they'd get whacked by the Patriot units that were around. They had um, Char uh, Savannah, which is the box down to the south of the map. And, um, and so they had still strategic post at uh, Mutt's Corner, uh, Utah Springs, I put the one on at Fort Watson, which had been captured. The British Army, the field army under Lord Rawdon, is sitting up at Fort Mott, which is in the upper, the, the highest point there to the north. And then they also had a garrison of loyalists at Orangeburg. So those are the places that, um, that the British are, are the strongest. Next, let's let me try it and see if it'll go. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, George is too close and it doesn't work, so you got it. So this is a blow-up of the same, the same map of 1780. Uh, in August 1780, of course, the British have a big problem because, you see, the British have been confined to an area that's maybe a fifth of South Carolina. Well, when they withdrew from 96 and from Camden, with the British came the uh, provincial army, pro uh, loyal militias, families, and many, many slaves. And most of those folks concentrated themselves in the greater Charleston area. They even had a little place there called Rawdon Town. And Rawdon Town would be a you know, cardboard slum um, that was dependent upon the largesse of the British government to, to feed, house, clothe, and what have you. And so um, to feed all of these folks as the Patriots began to capture more territory, as Christine was talking last night, it was necessary for them to go out in force and either buy supplies or forage. Now this is when Green begins to think of himself in terms of doing a, a siege of Charleston. Now this siege isn't like the British did where they dig siege lines, but he's moving in closer and closer and closer and trying to interrupt the commerce between anybody who wanted, to, any farmer who wanted some uh, hard currency by selling to the British and cutting and trying to cut the British supplies. So the British knew that one of the most productive agricultural areas in South Carolina is the South Carolina low country, especially uh, in what we call the Ace Basin today, especially along the Cumby River. And so around the 1st of August, Nesbitt Balfour, who's the command, commandant of Charlestown, sends um, a group of people, probably between 800 and 1,000, in a combined arms <coughs> operation to go into the um, St. Helena Sound and up the main rivers in that area. And the way the British worked this is they had riverine uh, craft, galleys, some sail powered, some row powered, some both, some armed with light cannon. And then they would send land troops into the same area, uh, complete with cavalry, infantry, light field artillery. And they would go up and down the river and you know, you'd have a hundred cavalrymen in your yard and they would knock on your door if you're a planter and they would explain the deal to you. You can either sell us some tercers of rice and we'll be glad to pay you for it. If you won't sell it to us, we're going we're gonna to come and take it for you, and we're going to probably burn you out and free, and free your slaves or take them off with us at the same time. So it's pretty clear communication. 
<laughs> and so they um, had some collection points, and they would actually make these planters um, surrender a good bit of um, produce, livestock, and, um, and especially rice. And so down the Cumbia River, they were um, gathering these supplies. Well, Francis Marion, uh, three months before, had detached one of his most trusted lieutenants, Colonel William Harden, to go to that area and do what we call Harden's campaign in uh, May of 1780. And Harden's goal basically was to try to control the area to the south and the west of the lower red line, which is down the uh, Beaufort area, going all the way down toward the Savannah River and toward Savannah, Georgia. And, and he had had great success. He took with him about 180 men, and he was able to rally the local militia to help him. And they took control of the upper roads between Charleston and Savannah. Um, Marion uh, in Green, by about the 12th of August, found out about this rice raid, as I call it, going on down in the uh, Low Country in the, in the Ace Basin. And Marion starts correspondence with Green, basically saying, you know, I really need to go to Colonel Harden's aid and assistance, and if I had a little bit of help, I could, I could shore him up. The other thing that's going on at this time is the British Army and the American patrols run into each other, first in the forks of the Edisto River, where the uh, Harden loses 18 men, and then a week later at Parsons Plantation, which is down on the Cumbie River, about, let's say, six or eight miles due north of uh, Yemassee, South Carolina. And uh, once again, the Americans get short of the stick. So in, in, in May and June, Harden is doing a good job of controlling this area. By August, with a thousand British uh, Navy, uh, infantry, cavalry um, down in the area, then the Patriots are no longer in control. So uh, the other thing that goes on on August the 4th is the British decide to hang Colonel Isaac Hayne. Now, Colonel Isaac Hayne is the militia commander for this area of South Carolina. And he's obviously an extremely popular guy. And the hanging of Hayne really cowered the turnout to the militia. So Hardin's corps of men was dependent upon the local militia turnout. So you've got basically a thousand British guys going up and down raiding all these plantations. This is an area that had been raided before. And the local militia is cowered from turning out. So Marion knows he has to act. Well, you would think that Marion would saddle up and ride on down there and, and take care of it. But over a two-week period, there's an amazing exchange of letters between, between General Green and General Marion. General Governor Rutledge has showed back up at the high hills and has entered Green's camp, so I'm sure Governor Rutledge was in the mix somewhere. But Marion writes Green and says, hey, we've got this rice raid going on down in the, in the lower part of the state. I need to go down there and help my man harden out. Uh, just want to know what you thought about it. Green would write it back and say, sure, that's a great idea. Why don't you go do that? I'm going to send William Washington sort of down in your area. He's at St. Stephen, South Carolina. That's where his camp is to bolster that area up. Then uh, Marion writes Green back and says, well, I really don't have any men here that can do this, and I need some, um, some troops. And Green writes back and says, oh, General Marion, no problem. You know, there's men down there. There's Peter O'Reilly's men. There's Hezekiah Mayhem's men. You know, just work with them and take what you need and, uh, and get it done. Then Green writes, and these are all these letters take three or four days to go each way. You know? And then Marion writes back and says, well, you know, Colonel Mayhem and, you know, Colonel um, O'Reilly don't really work for me. They're state troops, and the governor's put them under your command. And all this is going on while these plantations are being... Rob, and they're arguing about kind of who's in control, and I don't want to say Marion is saying, look, you know, you've kind of tied my hands here, but that's basically what he's doing. And finally, he says to Green, you've got to give orders directly to Mayhem and to already cooperate with me, which Green does. Now, all this takes at least two weeks before they get all this wrangling behind the scenes um, straightened out. So Marion uh, does, comes up with a plan to go help Harden now. Now Colonel Harden is camped at a little crossroad called Roundo on, uh, on Sanders' uh, plantation, which Green, by the way, will go to a year later to move his army. And uh, Marion um, 
Uh, Peter O'Ree is the commandant at this time. Georgetown has fallen, as Karen told us, and Peter O'Ree is there at Georgetown. Peter O'Ree's brother, Hugh, and a detachment of South Carolina Calvary are with Marion at St. Stephen's. And so a detachment of U O'Ree's Calvary, which is Peter O'Ree's Calvary, under Captain Cooper, is sent on a diversionary raid. And the diversionary raid leaves St. Stephen's and basically goes to Old Dorchester, the state park where Dorchester was, parades around, steals some cattle, then they go and they just make havoc in the Monk's Corner, Goose Creek area, where they're doing kind of very fast raids, capturing British people at taverns and things like that, rounding them up, but basically just stirring the pot in the Charleston Neck area of South Carolina. Meanwhile, Francis Marion, you can see the arc-shaped blue line, makes a circuitous route from um, St. Stephen to Roundo. And we don't know exactly where he went, and it's hard to figure out because the roads don't really run that way, but he's got to cross the two main routes that the British are using to go from Charleston, Monk's Corner, N uh, Nelson's Ferry, up to Fort Mott, or a more direct road up directly to Orangeburg. So those two roads are there at the time, and those are the two main British routes of communication, and he's got to cross all of that, ride 100 miles, take you two days, and end up down at, um, in, and end up down at Roundo which Marion does. He has 180 men with him, um, and, and he makes that ride. Everyone, everyone is mounted, two days. And, and that, a lot of it's done at night, by the way, because he's right in enemy territory, and he's kind of sneaking through there. Now, he arrives at Roundo, and he finds Colonel William Harden extremely ill. And not only is Harden ill, but Harden's men have pretty much all gone home. And so there's a, a small contingent camp. There's no way that there's any kind of a force there that's going to take a British army of, say, 800 people alone. I mean, that, that's not going to happen. And so Marion stays in that camp for two days, and he decides to go from that camp down to Horseshoe Savannah. And Horseshoe Savannah is on the road. If you've ever driven from Walterboro down to Jacksonboro, you cross right over the Horseshoe Creek, and that Horseshoe Savannah was there. And that's where Marion went to camp. And then a couple things uh, that really helped out start, started in motion. Number one, the lower Colleton County militia uh, under a guy named William Stafford came into camp with 150 men. So basically when Marion showed up at Hardin's camp, some of the captains left, went and called out the militia. And with Marion's there, and because of Marion's presence, these guys, in spite of the superior British force in the area, and these guys were basically home guard, you know, came out and came to Marion's camp. Colonel William Harden was still sick, and another major Harden came with 80 more people. And between the people Marion had brought with him, the um, Harden's men that came in, and Stafford's militia, Marion was up to 400 people, and he was feeling, feeling pretty good. So he goes from Horseshoe Savannah and starts west along the road that went from Savannah to Charleston. Now there's not one road, there's really two main roads, a low road and a high road. Like, you know, you take the high road, I'll take the low road. The high road generally crossed the rivers and creeks higher up in the drainage basin so that when you had wet weather, you could have a better chance of getting across. The low road is what we call Highway 17 today. So when you go over the bridge at the Cumbie River, or Cumbahee River, is how it looks like, you know, that is the old low road. The high road is still there today. It's a beautiful, wonderful one-lane road that uh, goes through Ritter, South Carolina, across the Fish Pond Bridge, across the uh, Godfrey Savannah, and into Highway 17A. Next slide. Oh, I got the slide, okay. <laughs> well, you can see down here that the British raiders are in this area of the Cumby River. The British are, comp are, are commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Ernest von Bork. And we hear of the Hessians all the time. And of course, most of the Germanic 
soldiers on the lease to King George are not from Hess Castle at all, but these were real Hessians. These Hessians were actually Hessians, and they're commanded by their Hessian colonel. Uh, also attached to him are the South Carolina Royalists under Thomas Frazier. And Thomas Frazier has a fascinating uh, a career of about two dozen battles, including the very last Fra Francis Marion battle where they face off again at the Avenue of the Cedars. Um, so, um, Marion um, comes to Colonel Hardin's camp here at Round Oak, moves down to Horseshoe, which is just outside of Jacksonboro. The British boats take off with all their goodies in them to Charleston. And the British um, detachment, land detachment under Boric and Fraser unite together around the Salkahatchee River, just a mile north um, east of modern Yemassee, South Carolina, is where all that's going on. Uh, Marion has intelligence that the British are camped at, um, at one of the many Middleton plantations. And this particular Middleton plantation is about right there. And so Marion takes his troops um, uh, from the camp here and goes on the old upper uh, high road and comes down here to what's called Godfrey's Savannah. The Godfrey's Savannah is in a stunningly beautiful place on Ritter Road. It's about five miles west of the, um, the little town of Ritter, a uh, little spot in the road called Ritter, South Carolina which I don't even think made the State Highway Department map. And the Savannah at that time had been like a highland swamp that had burned, been burned over and instead of being covered with trees, was covered with grass. It was later converted to upland rice paddies. And if you ride over the road today and look to your left and right, you'll see little dikes that are the remnants of the upland rice paddies that were there. And so Marion said, well, I'm going to ambush these troops. And so Marion takes a dozen or so people and puts them in the road. There's pretty much impassable swamp on each side of a very narrow causeway. And then he goes two miles away and camps. And so the idea was a British army of about 900 men were going to move to the east along what is called Ritter Road today. And I have a dozen people going to stop the British Army and hold them while Marion brought his troops up from two miles away. Can you guess how well that worked? <laughs> it didn't work at all. I mean, the British just walked right through the guards. I don't think that any, anybody even got off a shot. And it, it just utterly failed. And so the first ambush that was in this park of ferry thing just blew up there. The British continue to own back to the east. They're headed back to Fort Dorchester, which is old Dorchester Park. The British go to Edmund Hearn's plantation. Now, if you read much of the campaign in 1780 to 1702, Edmund Hearn is there. He's the aide de camp and a uh, very influential officer with Green. And he had a plantation um, on the west side of the upper Ashpoo uh, River drainage basin, which is generally in the area called the fish ponds. And they camped at Hearn's plantation. So Marion just kind of gets his men and comes up to the edge of the camp, and there's some sniping back and forth. But Marion didn't have the men to be able to make an open attack into a camp that was so called well posted, and so that didn't work. Now, at this time, um, the British goal is to get back with as few casualties as they can and to get the supplies back. I mean, they're really not at this point into fighting Francis Mary. That's not really exactly their goal. So the British leave the camp at Edmund Hearns. They go south a little bit to the modern crossroads called Ashipoo. And Ashipoo is, a, I guess, a railroad stop. And they come up. And they come across the Ashpoo River here, go up by Jacksonboro, and go to Edmund to, and go to Isaac Haynes Plantation. I hope some of you've been to Isaac Haynes' grave. And one of the men with the British at that point writes that the grave of Isaac Haynes was fresh, because when they hung him on the 4th of August, they brought him from Charleston to his plantation near Jacksonboro and buried him there. And so I think the very next day the British set up in camp. 
So, um, now, Marion's got a problem at this point. If you're going to ambush somebody, you got to get in front of them. You can't ambush somebody from behind, and the British have gone around Marion, and so Marion's now behind them. Now, he can maybe sneak up behind them and, uh, and attack them. So it's not like the British don't know he's there. They've already had two skirmishes with him. Why would you want to ambush him? Well, you know, any kind of a tactical advantage you can get is important when you have fairly equally matched forces. And I don't think these forces were really equally matched because the British had artillery and Marion had no artillery. So in any kind of a pitched battle, that they could bring the artillery and up to bear, that was a very more than an equalizer. From, so Marion had to somehow leapfrog and get around the British. The British, he thought, were probably headed for Parker's Ferry. Now, on the map, if you want to cross the Edisto River, you can go across to Jacksonburg. This is Highway 17, and Highway 17 goes back to Charleston. But Marion has pretty much figured out that instead of going directly back to Charleston, they're probably going back to Dorchester, and they'll put the goodies on boats and ship them down the Ashley River. Uh, and so, to go to Dorchester, you're probably going to cross the river upstream, and upstream is going to be at a place called Parker's Ferry. Also, Marion probably knows they're headed for Parker's Ferry because there's a Loyalist camp there. And so, Von Borick and Fraser are headed back to a Loyalist camp that is command commanded by Cunningham. Well, who, which Cunningham is this? It's not Robert, because he's General Cunningham, and we know where he is. Bloody Bill starts as Bloody Scout soon thereafter. We don't think it's Bloody Bill, so it's probably his brother, it's probably his cousin Patrick, is who we think is probably the commander of the British Loyalist camp there at Parker's Ferry. So there's another alternate road beside going this way into Jacksonboro and up to Parker's Ferry. And Marion takes the alternate road and, um, and, and gets in front of, in other words, between Isaac Haynes Hain Hall Plantation and Parker's Ferry, which is about six miles away. Now this is who is with um, both Marion and who is with the British. And the best counts we have is the British at this time have about 560 men. Now the British had more men than that involved, but a good many of them had been, you know, they loaded the boats to the gills and, and a lot of them sailed back to Charleston by water instead of coming over land. And this group is the only ones going over land. Down here is Hain Hall. Uh, it's, it, Hain Hall was at the same place that the tomb is now. And this road is an extant dirt road that goes um, up here to Parker's Ferry. And you can drive on it today in dry, in dry land. That road is straight as a string, obviously laid out by a surveyor, and it's through very marshy territory. What happens is on August the 30th is that the British in the afternoon have rested up and start moving toward Parker's Ferry and their camp there at Parker's Ferry. Marion has come overland this way and set up an ambush one mile west of Parker's Ferry. And he's done it in three different lines. Now, you know, any military plan only lasts till you start taking the first action. And so Marion gets up here, gets an ambush. This line is 40 yards off the Parker's Ferry Road, and these two lines are about 100 yards off the Parker's Ferry Road. Some loyalists from this camp start riding down this road. And though we don't know what they were doing, it was just a few horsemen, but they see some kind of movement or some, you know, one rider said they saw a piece of white in one of Marion's men's hats. You know, we never really know that. But anyway, a gunfire starts. And the loyalists, of course, turn right around and run back into their camp. But you can't have an ambush, you know, if somebody started firing guns and you know where everybody is. Meanwhile, the whole British column is headed up this way. And von Borick's infantry and artillery are in the front, and Thomas uh, Fraser's cavalry is bringing up the rear. When this 
accidental firing happens, this column is a mile or two away, but you know they're out in the middle of nowhere and it's quiet and you can hear a gunshot a long way off. So Von Borick calls Frazier and says, jump around in front of us and go up there and see what that firing's all about. It's probably those partisans who've been harassing us for the whole, for the whole trip and just knock them out of the way like we've done before. And so Von Borick's heavily, you know, he's got artillery, he's got wagons, he's infantry, they're not in any particular rush to get anywhere. They don't know that they're going into, into Marion's uh, camp, and it's getting late in the afternoon. Well, Frazier goes up in front and comes right into here and starts running there, and he doesn't realize that he's kind of running down that line of Marion's men. And Frazier's men get absolutely chopped up. Um, one source reads that Frazier took 125 cavalry and dozens of cavalry horses um, were, were killed in the road. Now this road is probably one wagon width wide. And if you go there today, they talk about being ambushed on the causeway. There is no causeway. The road is maybe that much higher than you know, the surrounding land and if you got a lot of rain in there, it's going to flood. And so if you think of it as being a causeway like the one, say, coming over the Congaree Swamp, it, it, nothing like that. I don't doubt that it wasn't raised just a little bit, but you know it was something you could take one step and go off. About the time that Frazier's horses are getting chopped up all in here, Von Borick double times his troops and moves on up. Now this is getting really late in the afternoon, and um, it's around sunset when the whole thing starts. This is all pretty much, I would say, jungle out here. And so you just, there's some roads through there and a few little farms, but it's not open land. And if you get three or 400 yards off that road, you, you know, you could be in the middle of Venezuela and not know any difference. And so there becomes, as Von Borick's infantry comes, he starts moving in in this direction into the side of Marion. And one of the men holler out, and we don't really know if it, which side it was on, hey boys, they're flanking us. Well, that was enough for Hardin's men to kind of take off. And Marion realized in a hurry that, that he was probably not going to be able to gather his men in this highly wooded, highly grown up undergrowth terrain in this area. And so they do a fallback basically to where they have the horses tied up. Well, Frazier is having the same thoughts as Marion. The sun's going down. They're in pretty thick, overgrown woods. He really doesn't know who he's facing. He cannot cross the causeway because the causeway is choked with dead bodies and dead horses. I mean, the, the causeway is stopped up. And so he says, I'm going to fall back in group. Well, Marion, you know, kind of stops, falls back a little bit, and then all the fighting just sort of stops. At this point, Frank, there's a retrograde move, but I don't know how far, probably a mile or something like that. And Von Boring gets the wounded, gets as many of Frazier's men who've been utterly decimated out of it he can and kind of goes into camp. Marion actually comes out onto the road, and I'm sure they're taking anything of use because cavalry sabers, saddles, all that kind of stuff is uh, in short supply. Of course, there's some nice horses there with the brand CLD on them. Continental Light Dragoons that the British had gotten at probably Monk's Corner or Lanoud's Ferry. And um, I think he probably captured some of those back. Marion actually holds the road in the European sense of who the victor is. At this point, Marion's had three casualties. The British have had about 125. So Marion withdraws at that point. Um, two miles away, feeds his men, sends his men back the next morning. The British have cleared the road and have moved on up to Parker's Ferry. Marion withdraws, goes back to Roundo, and then back to St. Stephen's. Now all this happened on the 30th of August of 1781. Um, we know somewhat about what happened because of con fairly contemporaneous writings. 
I don't expect you to be able to read this, but this was published on September the 13th in the Royal uh, Georgia Gazette. So this is the British spin on it. And it's down here. You know, Lieutenant Colonel DeBorek at Parker's Ferry on the 31st, by the way, the wrong date already, you know, gets in with General Ma Major and, uh, and basically it's a little minor skirmish, no big deal. That's, that's what this, this report says. This is the New Jersey Gazette. And the New Jersey Gazette, I, I know you can't read this, but this is a long letter here from Francis Marion dated September the 3rd of 1781. When you look at the Marion letters, 90% of Marion's letters are very practical, very short letters, you know, I need some salt, some rum, and a horse, please send them to me. That's, that's what he's written. This is the only really complete, detailed battle report that I've ever seen from Francis Marion. Now, Dave, you may have a different take on it. And I do thank Dave for for pointing me to some of these sources. And um, the Marion letter is a detailed description of the battle, tells when, where, what the sequences of affairs was, and, and it, of course it's published now uh, in the newspapers. The, um, of course, the casualties to the cavalry, the casualties um, do have some effect of this battle. Uh, Jim is going to be here up in a, in a couple presentations. And there are some thought that there was a great impediment that um, Stewart had at Utah Springs because of the lack of cavalry that he had. And one of the great reasons that he lacked cavalry, although in his report, he voluntarily said, I had plenty of cavalry. Now Green snuck up on me. And I was paying good attention, but he snuck up on me, and I had plenty of cavalry, right? Well, this is why his cavalry was probably cut about in half, uh, you know, a week later at the Battle of Utah Springs. Uh, Francis, Marion, uh, Francis Marion had wonderful publicity, and we know about a lot of this stuff because of publicity. And so when I was studying the Battle of Parker's Ferry, I go to everybody's favorite favorite source, my copy of Ori and Wings. And I was going to read up on Parker's Ferry, not mentioned. And so I was speculating with Dave about why would, you know, an important military action that's a clear victory that has clear positive impact not be mentioned. And my only guess is that, of course, Wings is based on, on Peter Ori, and Peter Ori's in Georgetown. And so while he has direct access to the people where they just didn't he kind of quit writing about it at that time and Weems book kind of peters out and goes into dialogue and other things else that a, a Weems wanted to cover but it's just not in that book then the, the next good biography we have of course is James and James is much more complete but James tells a very different story and it's funny to read these different stories because in James, um, they say that Marion does an ambush like this. Marion sends men off to drag, to, to entice the British to come in, and the British come chasing him in. Well, in fact, when the few loyalists came up and some fire was exchanged, Marion had detached 15 men toward Parker's Ferry to go chase those guys. And so if you were in the ranks and you saw men run off, and then a few minutes later the whole British army shows up, I think you might come to the conclusion that's what Marion was doing. But Marion didn't say that's what he was doing. And the 15 men went off in the opposite direction. So <laughs> I think that's a coincidence. But in James, and in books that followed James, that story of, uh, of having the um, setup and having the bait and drawing the British in is told and told over again as, is, as if it is the truth. And Sims verbatim copies James. And I, I was gonna read them to you today, but it's not enough light and it's too tedious. But Sims' history 
word for word plagiarizes James. And of course, maybe in the 19th century when this was done, that was okay to do. <laughs> McCready wrote a wonderful book, Edward McCready, about the turn of the 19th and 20th century on the Revolutionary War in South Carolina. He goes right back to Sims, who went right back to James, who told the story of leading the British into the ambush. Now, it's apparent to me that when these histories were written, they did not have access to the newspaper reports, Marion's letter that was published in the newspaper, and it's a letter to, to Green, so that letter uh, ended up in the Green Papers in the Library of Congress. Next we have Robert Bass, and Robert Bass, of course, is largely unsighted, and Robert Bass pretty much parrots the story that McCready got from Sims, who got it from James, that is not what Marion says himself. And so instead of reporting what Marion said, they're reporting, I guess, what they were told and what other soldiers came to the conclusion. And then finally, I look him up in Rankin, which, which I think Rankin's the biography of Marion is pretty good. And Rankin is beginning to tease out kind of what happened, except that he says, yes, there was an ambush, and yes, there was a decoy squad that was sent out. And, and so my point in talking about this wonderful victory of Francis Marion is that it's a really good one full of details since Marion's report was so detailed. Like I say, it's the most detail of Marion's military reports that I know of, so that you can then look at the story and how it evolved over time and how historian and writer and fiction writer copied each other till that becomes uh, written down in the, in the way that the story is retold today. Now, I put this slide up because I hope you have a chance to go to the, to the battlefield. Um, this is, the main, this is the main road from, um, from Walterboro this way to Jacksonboro this way. Uh, Dave is going to talk a little bit about the assembly at Jacksonboro. And the Parker's Ferry Road runs about seven miles from, um, from this highway to where it deads in, dead ends at the Edisto River. The wonderful site, the Burnt Church, um, is, is right there. The St. Bartholomew's Chapel of East, that's the so-called Pon Pon Chapel, is right there. General Haynes' tomb is here, which is where Hain Hall was, and, and it's publicly available and accessible, and you can go to Hain Hall today. And then you can ride down to Parker's Ferry Road, and when you're about a mile from the river, is, is where the battle was fought. In addition to General Marion's account that was written on the third day of September when he was back in St. Stephen, we also have a first person British account that was written fairly contemporaneous with the events. And as funny as it is to me, or as interesting as it is to me, that, um, that the historians uh, uh, copied James's version, it almost looks like Marion and Lieutenant Jarvis were talking to each other because they both identically describe the battle. And Stephen Jarvis is a lieutenant um, who, um, was a cavalry lieutenant who had been tangled up in the fight. And Stephen Jarvis um, described the location of the battle and the way the events unfold and mentioned nothing about bait and chasing anybody into an ambush. Uh, as if he and Marion had conspired, you know, the week after the battle to write it down. So, is there, are there any questions about Marion's victory uh, on the Edisto River? Yes, sir. Do you know if James was at that battle? He was one of Marion's guys? I, I don't know, and there's no contemporaneous record that tells us that. From reading James' book, you certainly can't tell that he was there. And he was sick during that period of time, and I don't know if this was when he was sick or not. I'm talking about the son, William. I don't know about the father. But there's no record that indicates that the father was there. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Carroll. First of all, I want to thank you for the, it was a great presentation. I always had a very hard time reading that battle out, reading Bass and Rankin, and you explained why. Um, so thank you. 
if you go down that area, there's some pretty big earthworks, not only at the ferry itself, but along the river. Uh, do you have any knowledge of those? Yeah, I have. Um, uh, Karen's absolutely right. There's an amazing earthwork right at Parker's Ferry. The earthwork is shaped kind of like a lazy Z, and um, and it's it's huge. It's, I would say it's um, in most places about 10 feet tall. Um, Mike Coker has done a lot of research on plats to the area and early maps of the area, of which we have some beautiful ones. There's no mention of it. We've looked in the Civil War records where they documented most of the battlements. No mention of it in the Civil War records. Plus, if you look at it and have been to other Civil War era earthworks, you know, they don't look the same way. They're just not set up for cannon. They're not set up to defend anything. And so I'm convinced that they're non-military. All up and down the Congaree River are things called cattle mounts. And the several cattle mounts I've seen are the, look the same. This thing has a ramp. On, it's the long axis is parallel to the flow of the river. And then it has a ramp on each end so a cow can walk up it. The farmers evidently would have these huge floods, the water would come up in the swamp, and the cows somehow knew to get up on top of these mounds and save.